question that we had I heard in college, we're going to this Christian college, heard often is if you were charged, caught, and if you were if you were arrested, I should say, for your Christianity, would there be enough evidence to convict you? I heard that over and over in college as we were kind of challenged people. I want to play off of that question today and phrase something a little bit different. If you were to be in a spiritual beauty pageant, or try to be in a spiritual beauty pageant, with the standard being the image of Christ and the chief virtue being the love of Christ, would there be enough about you that would even qualify you for the pageant? (laughs) Essentially, as we get to our section today, as we kind of come to the end of a particular section, that's that's what Peter, the Apostle Peter, is talking about. You see, I think the Apostle Paul, as well as the Apostle Peter, and I think even our Lord, you may not find this in the finer print of the Scripture, but I think they were basically, at times they said, the church is to be the beauty salon. Unfortunately, so many beauty salons, if it's the church is a beauty salon, unfortunately, there's so many that are not very, they're not producing beauty. I mean, imagine if you walked into a beauty salon and all the hairdressers, I'm not sure what the name is there, but all of them had their hair just out of control. Would you want to go there? And even the people who were in the chair looked even worse. Would you say, I want to be a part of that? No, no. Our Lord, in in, in these two verses, passages, changed my philosophy of ministry when I was in seminary and coming out of seminary. Jesus said, John 13, 34 and 35, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, one another of the same kind, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now watch this next verse. By this Will all, by this all men will know that you are my disciples. What? If you're fundamental, conservative, Bible-believing, evangelical, disciple-making people. Now, those are all important, right? But that's not what he said. He said, if you have love for one another. Jesus in John 17 21 said, prayed for his disciples, and he said, that they may be all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That, that, purpose clause, that they also may be in us, so that the world may, watch this, the world may believe that, what? You have sent me. Did you get that? Did you get what he was saying? He was saying the greatest apologetic that Christ has come is the evidence of that in the lives of believers as they relate to one another. I um, grew up in the Bible Belt before I went out to, uh, before we went out to Southern California to go to Talbot Seminary. Before, but before I left, I was disillusioned by the church. I was a youth pastor for a while, and this church that was just, the only way to say it was just they were very affluent. And I I sat in a business meeting, which they debated and argued for an hour or so over whether they should raise uh, support for a missionary from $50 to $100 that a missionary at an Indian reservation out west. Now, keep in mind, they have just put in this gorgeous organ. 
thousands of dollars. In fact, I told them, I want to go to, I want to, go to my hometown to a Youth for Christ uh, event. I want to take our youth. No problem. They rented me a Greyhound bus. And so all I had seen from many churches is that the, the fighting and the bickering, and, and I said, Lord, your grace has to be better than that. God's people have to be better than that. And thankfully, God shaped my thinking and my, my philosophy of ministry. I love the story about the, the, the pastor who went into this with the director of this insane asylum he walked in there and he saw a hundred inmates there and only three guards and 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 the pastor said to the director he said you see the only he saw those three guards and he said aren't you afraid that the the inmates will unite and overcome the guards not at all he said lunatics never unite And I wonder what that has to say about the church today sometimes. Hmm. Hmm. Peter's talking about a, a, a beautiful body of believers. One that's attracted to the world. Uh, he begins to, as you may recall, he begins by talking about you are to submit as a citizen. You are to submit as a citizen to any authority st- structure in your life. If it's over you, unless it's un- immoral, unbiblical, or unethical, e- it demands you to do any of those, then you don't. But be careful with that. I've seen believers who are subjective. They say, well, uh, well. And then he goes to the servant, which would apply to us as employees. And he says, you are to submit to your, though, anyone that's over you. And then he goes to the wife who has an unbelieving husband, and she's, he says, a believing wife, and he says, just because you've come to Christ doesn't mean that now you're free. You are still to follow the leadership, submit yourself, arrange yourself under your husband, even if he's unfair. And then he turns it around, flips it, and says, men, you are to love your wife, even if she's difficult and an unbeliever at that. Now it comes to the end of the section, and he says, Here's what you ought to do. And he turns the attention back on the believers. He's already talked to them once. We'll go to that in just a few moments. He's already talked to them once about what they are to become. But now he turns it back and he says, you are to focus your love on each other so that when the world looks at you, they stand up and take note and they say, wow, how those people love. My first church in Riverside, California, young guy, didn't know what I was doing. But boy, we had a group of people who just loved each other. And just, uh, our, just I was, it was an evangelical free church, and that's, uh, if you don't know what that is, well, Chuck Swindoll was an evangelical free for, uh, pastor for many years. Uh, but the, uh, the district superintendent said there, there was a hilarious spirit, spirit in, in the, our church. But one Sunday after church, someone came up to me, and they said, would you tell me how I can, essentially they said, can you tell me how I can know Christ? Sure. Of course, we pastors, we always try to run through our mind, what was it so that, that, that I said that was so dynamic that drew them to Christ? Obviously, I must have done something, said something. So I asked her, I said, what was it that I said today that caused you to come up? Well, it wasn't anything you said. It was just the love that I felt in this congregation. Hmm. Hmm. Today, the question is, how do we become a catalyst for beauty? And before we go to our chapter 3, I want you to turn back to chapter 2. And understand what Peter is saying. I said that we're coming to the conclusion of a flow of thought. And remember, chapter breaks are not inspired of God. The text is, but chapter breaks are not. And so you'll see that in chapter 12, 
the Apostle Peter, actually verse 11, begins a, a train of thought. And verse 11 says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and as strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Now here it is. Keep your behavior excellent. Remember what I said about that word excellent? It, it's a, a very elastic Greek word. It can be translated good, but it also can be translated winsome, attractive, excellent, of course, and several other words. But what was he saying? He was saying keep your behavior attractive. In other words, be what God wants you to be so that the world, when he says in verse 12, he says, excellent among the Gentiles, among the unbelievers, so that the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. What does that mean, glorify God in the day? Essentially, it means they come to Christ. They see your life, they see your behavior, they see your love among, uh, among each other, and they come to Christ. So the question before us today is, how can I be a catalyst for beauty in the body of Christ? Now, again, there's some uh, uh, Bible teachers uh, who, who take this text, and they say that the, what we see in verse 8, beginning in verse 8, going through verse 12, really has to do with... Uh, uh, Peter is saying, look, these are the marks of a mature believer. Thus, you can measure your life by that. That's true, but as we're taught in seminary, we, the, our job is to get the big picture of the text. And the text, remember what I say over and over, context, context, context. What's the context? It begins in verse 11 and 12. And, he's, and now, Peter comes to verse 8, and he says, to sum it up, now, how can I be a, a catalyst? Where I think in this passage, that this passage could be divided between verse 8 and the rest of the, the pa paragraphs, I guess, or section. Uh, and here's what I would say. We become a catalyst first by right thinking, by right attitude. Everything begins with the right attitude. <laughs> I, I, I had that lesson taught to me uh, by a coach, basketball coach. I, I can't remember what it was, but I copped an attitude with our coach, and he, he put me on the second team, and boy, I didn't like that, and I didn't change. And I remember we had a practice when we had another guy on our team named Charlie Morgan, and, and, um, and he was on the second team, and, and I remember there was a, a, a practice where we, anything you threw up, anything I threw up, anything Charlie threw up, just went in. It just went in. It was one of those days. You just get those days in basketball. Some days you can't hit the side of a barn, but some days you, when you shoot, everything goes in. And I thought, I'll teach him. And he made, the, he made everybody run, first team and second team run, because we were scoring so many points against the first team. But later on, the coach pulled me aside, and he said, Byron, he said, I don't care how good you are until you change your attitude. You will not start for me. It's a hard lesson. I had to learn that. Attitude is everything. Let's go to verse 8 of chapter 3. He says, to sum up, all of you be harmonious. Again, he's saying, to sum up what he's already said, and the first thing he says is to be harmonious. Now, let me just say this. I believe what Peter is saying is, I want you to be a fully functioning church. There are three characteristics of a dysfunctional family. Let me just name one, and I think you'll understand. I believe that Peter is saying, I want you to be not a dysfunctional family, as churches are. Churches are families and thus sometimes very dysfunctional. One of the characteristics of a dysfunctional family is that they cannot resolve their conflict. They can't sit down and resolve their conflict. Now, all families, healthy, unhealthy, have conflict. 
And so a dysfunctional family cannot sit down and resolve conflict. A dysfunctional Christian cannot sit down and resolve conflict. So here Peter gives some characteristics that should permeate the functional church. And note the word he begins with. It begins with being, by being harmonious. Being of the same mind is the, there are two Greek words. The, this word is made up of two Greek words, I should say. Herma, homos and phronas. One means, the first one means one or the same. The second means the mind or understanding. So it means to think the same, have the same understanding clearly it calls the church body to unity uh, several passages reflect that let's uh, we're going to be going to a number of different passages so hang on to your surfboard we're going to be moving to a lot of different ones but in chapter 12 of Romans and some of you may just want to watch the data projector in the 12th chapter of Romans, he says, be of the same mind towards one another. And by the way, when you see the word one another, when it says be of the same mind, so forth, the word another is, means another of the same kind. There are two words for another in the Greek, another of a different kind, and the another of the same kind. This means another of the same kind. If I go to a, a, a jewelry store and I say I want, a, I want a, another watch, I may mean that I want another watch that's like this. Or it may mean I, I want another watch totally different than this. The word that's used here is another of the same kind. So he's talking to believers. By the way, there are more mandates. <laughs> this is interesting. There are more mandates in, in, in the Scripture, New Testament, about believers loving believers than believers loving unbelievers. You find that interesting? I do. Probably because we have greater expectations, and we should to some degree. So he says you're to be harmonious. Now, one of the things that the Greeks were notorious for, and we don't, I'm not saying it necessarily is true here, but it could be true. We don't know. But one of the things that the Greeks were notorious for is that they would give a primary statement, and then they would follow it with the substance. Kind of like a movie marquee that says, Gone with the Wind, and then the, the smaller letters that says Clark Gable and you know, all the other actors. Paul did that a lot. He would give a primary statement, then he'd come back behind it and give the substance of that. That could be what Paul is, I mean, Peter is doing here. He could be giving the primary statement. Be harmonious. In any event, let's take a look at it again. Th th we are told to be of one mind. Just, if you want to write these verses down, uh, here are some that speak to this. It is the Bible, the New Testament, is replete. And, and let me say this too. I feel total freedom here because our church, as far as I know, we don't have any of that stuff of backbiting and so forth. Oh, we're, we have believers with sin natures, and we say things and do things sometimes to one another that may not be correct, but we love each other. I'm thankful for the love in this body. Uh, so so I'm, not, I'm not hammering anybody. I'm not out to get anybody. Somebody, often people say, well, we give a message. I have total freedom to preach the word of God. Uh, and that's what I want to do, without worrying about offending somebody or whatever. But let's look at some, well, some of the verses. I'm just going to name some of the verses. 1 Corinthians 1.10, the apostle Paul rebuked the quarreling Christians, telling them that they should not be, there should not be any division among them, and that they should be perfectly joined together. 1 Corinthians 10.17, Paul talks about one bread, one body. In 1 Corinthians 12. Verse 12 through 31, he states that even though we have differing qualities and gifts, we are one body. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, he says you should be of one mind and live in peace. And in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, he talks about the body of Christ building itself up in love and unity. What's the glue that holds it together? Love and unity. We had a, in California, the church I mentioned, we had to discipline a couple. And the, and, and the husband came back to me later, a few, several years later, in fact, after I'd left Southern California. He said, you were right. You were right. He keeps in contact 
with me to this day. He says, you were right, we were wrong. And he said, you know what hurt so much? Was the love, we had to ask him to leave. And they said, what hurt so much was the love we lost when we left that church that day. You have no leverage unless you have love and grace in a body of Christ. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. It says, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. That's a great statement. Only conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel hmm. of Christ. So that, purpose clause, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. John MacArthur, speaking of a passage we're covering today, said, this spiritual reality should be the basis for the church's visible harmony. Visible. You know what that word? Visible. In other words, the wor- world should see, should stand up and take note. Oh, how they love one another. He says the early church was a model of visible oneness. Now, I hasten to ask the question. Does oneness mean that we all agree on everything? Absolutely not. It's the legalistic church that says everybody has to look and believe the same. Chuck Swindoll, Charles Swindoll said it well. He said, unity isn't the same as uniformity, where everybody looks and acts exactly the same, nor is it the same as unanimity when everybody has to agree 100% on everything. Peter isn't calling us to sing together in unison, but in harmony, which means we all contribute our unique notes in a beautiful chorus that far surpasses any single note. Isn't that good? One of the things that I hold to, those who know me well, and you've come through our welcome class, you've heard me talk about this, I love what Augustine said, theologian Augustine. He once said, in the essentials, there should be unity. In the non-essentials, there should be diversity. In all things, there should be charity. There should be love. Now, what what did that mean? Let's exegete that statement. What do you mean in the essentials? In the essentials, there has to be unity. The blood of Christ, the virgin birth, the means of salvation, by faith through grace. Uh, the, I could go on and on. The things, the things that have to do with my salvation, there can be no compromise. And we won't. We, we will never do that. We'll never dumb, we, we will never dummy down the gospel of Christ. But in the non-essentials, there's plenty of room for diversity. The church that, the legalistic church that's, that's so uncomfortable with our diversity of opinion is not a healthy church. Same with the family. One of the things I, um, I appreciate about a men's Thursday morning Bible study is that there's room to differ even over the non essentials. And we do. Sometimes we debate, there's good spirited debate. But all in love, no one gets angry, no one gets upset. Sometimes we get a little too, too strong, but we always bring it back. That's grace. That's a healthy body. And, and, let, let me, and so you ask the question, how do we get there to grace? Here's something that will help you, I think, as you look at other believers. And maybe you've never heard this before. We are all, as believers, we're all at different levels of maturity and differing degrees of commitment. We're all on a journey, aren't we? We're not all at the same place. If, if you have uh, three children, say age 6, 10, 
15. Are you going to expect the six-year-old to have the same understanding as the 15-year-old? No. Mm -mm. See, when we understand that we're all on, on this pilgrimage, this journey, spiritual journey, and we're not all at the same place, and if you doubt what I'm saying is true, then just look at Romans 14 and, and 1 Corinthians 8. We'll reference those passages again. Some will say, well, are you saying then that, that, uh, are you saying then that we compromise with sin when a, a, a believer is sinning? No, absolutely not. But here's what we do do. We separate the sin from the sinner. We love the sinner. We hate the sin. There's a difference. And unfortunately, having grown up in the church from the time I was nine, in diapers, in fact, over the years I've seen churches that cannot separate the two. So the first thing he said, and I'll spend more time there because I really think that's the tone of this text. The second thing that we see in this passage back in chapter 3, verse 8, is that of being empathetic. The word, Greek words made up of two words, together and to feel. You put it together and it means to have compassion, to feel with someone. Edmund Hybert, the, the, the well-known scholar you've heard me mention before, says it connotes the readiness to enter into and share in the feelings of others that enables one to rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with those who weep. See, a beautiful church is one in which people relate to each other, I get this, on a real level. They're allowed to be real. They're allowed to be less than perfect. They're allowed to struggle. We do struggle. Uh, what we do is we cover up the cracks in our armor so that make some, so, so often in churches because and, and I blame the churches because they put pressure on believers to be perfect. If we cover up the cracks in our armor, how will the grace of God show forth through those cracks? says you enter in it means you enter in this word means you enter into the pain and the struggle of others how many of you have seen the redwood trees in california the giant redwood trees you've seen them in the in a book if you haven't seen them in person i've seen them in person big enough to drive a truck through you would think those giant redwoods would have to have deep deep roots wouldn't you I mean, how do they stand by themselves? You think that. They don't. They have very shallow roots. Just a few inches, maybe a foot below the ground. But all their roots are intertwined. And they are held up by the other trees' roots. That's what the church is to be. That's what Paul, Peter is talking about here. Now, moving on. The next thing we see is by being affectionately devoted. Affectionately devoted. The, the, my translation in verse 8 says brotherly. I don't particularly like that translation, but we'll use that. It's a wor Greek word, philodephos, and it's the adjective form of the word that's used back in chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, I believe it is. Um, talks about brotherly love. In chapter, yeah, verse 22, it says, Since you have in obedient the truth, purified your soul for in sincere love of the brethren. Now, he uses the heirs tense there. It has the idea that you have once and for all been purified in the sense that you've come to Christ. He goes on to talk about the seed in verse 23 that's been planted within you, which is the Holy Spirit. But here he says, you have been purified, uh, your soul has been purified uh, for a unhypocritical love is the word. Of the brethren. The same word, this is the same word where it says the love of the brethren, it's the same word. And then he goes on to say, fervently, agape, one another, 
from the heart. What's he saying? The word's made up of two words, philodephos. It's made up of the word adephos, which means brother, and uh, philos, which means loves. Now, many people have been misguided by this word. And you see, in the ancient times, the, the, uh, the meaning of philos, or phileo, was that of a love that a brother or sister might have with one another. Now, the church, many people, I've heard people grab this word and say, well, that, that means that in the church, it means to have the brotherly affection and, and, and love that you would have for your brother or sister. Uh, not quite. It means something much deeper than that. It's not at the level of, of agape, but it, it's also different than agape in its nature. In fact, You can have agape towards an unbeliever. You cannot, in my view, have philos towards an unbeliever. Because philos speaks of a deep affection and devotion to one another. Uh, I, I covered this back uh, a couple of years ago in January, speaking on marriage, but then even a few years before that. But let's just kind of walk through the... Uh, and, and let's look at the, the contextual meaning of this word so I can show you what I, I'm talking about. First, in John 11, it's a passage where Lazarus is raised from the dead. And Jesus comes late. You know the story, perhaps. And then in chapter 11, in beginning of verse 34, Jesus said, Where have you laid him? And they said, Here, Lord, come see and it says that Jesus wept. You know that verse. And then it says in verse 36, So the Jews were saying, See how he loved him. The word loved is a word philos or phileo. Did Jesus just love him with a brotherly, casual kind of love? I don't think so. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22, it says, If anyone does not love, phileo, the Lord, he is to be accursed, meonatha. Is that to be a casual kind of love? I mean, here's, here's another question for you. Does God love us with the same phileo, philos, kind of love? Well, I think he does. The answer is found in Revelation chapter 3, verse 19. It says, those whom I love, there it is, phileo, I reprove in discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Does Jesus discipline those that he casually loves? No. And, and by the way, the Greek here is those whom I am loving, continuous action. No. So we, we discover that God loves every believer with this phileo love, this devotion, this deep devotion and affection. John 16, verse 27, it says, For the Father himself loves phileo you, phileo you because you have loved phileo me and have believed that I came from the Father. One last verse. Be do, in, in Romans 12, 10, it says, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Same word again, phileo. Be devoted. There you see the, the being, devoted being coupled with that of affection. The thing of beauty, I think, is when you see a group of people who love each other, who care about one another, and the world says, wow, how they love, how they care for one another. I, I I played sports all my life, football, basketball, baseball, even ran track. And uh, and I've, I've played on a lot of different teams, some were, that were almost state champs in basketball, other teams that were not that good. But the teams that, were, that played above what we'll call above their head were the teams, the, team, the teams I was a part of, at least, were those who really liked each other, who really liked each other. 
My junior year, we almost won the state championship, and everybody was coming back, and they said, this team has to be it. This, has, this team, has, because many of us had a parade All-American that played on one side, and then we had an All-Stater who played at baseline. And, and our first game, they said, all starting five, all scored in double figures. But guess what? That team that was picked to go all the way to the state didn't even get out of the district. Why? Because the All-Stater was jealous of the Parade All-American. And division affected how we played. Let's keep moving. Next thing he says, back in chapter 3, verse 8, being kind-hearted. Now, kind-hearted is an adjective that, in the Greek, that is derived from a noun which means or speaks of the internal organs, the internal organs. You see, the Greeks associated this word with the inward parts, organs, bowels. And they viewed it as, when you spoke of the internal organ, they used it as speaking of courage. We today say you have to have what? Guts. Right, guts. Uh, the Hebrew people saw it differently. The Hebrews saw it to speak of being affectionately sensitive, quick to show compassion and understanding. Again, if we were to use the vernacular of our day, the Hebrew people would say, have a heart. Have a heart. What do they mean? Well, in Ephesians chapter 4, this same word is translated differently. In chapter 4, verse 32, it says, Be kind to one another. Now, here it is. Tenderhearted, forgiving each other. Just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. Again, Chuck Swindoll, speaking of this verse, or it says, The heartfelt compassion closely associated with forgiveness. This heartfelt compassion, I should say, closely associated with forgiveness emphasizes the action taken to reach out to those who are hurting. But it means you take a heart, you have a heart of compassion, a heart of forgiveness. In a family, you have, in a real family, biological family, you have conflict. You have kids that will argue with you, and you sometimes argue with the kids. What do you do? The Bible says love covers a multitude of sin. What does that mean? It means that I forgive. I don't say to our kids, you're gone. Pack your bag and go. You didn't agree with me. You're not doing what I tell you to do. And that's, this is the idea there of accepting. If we were to go to Romans chapter 14, you remember that. And I'm, uh, I'll just reference it. In Romans 14, there was an issue of eating meat offered to idols. The, Jew, the, the weak Jews saw it as sinful. How could you... Uh, they would sell the meat off to idols in the restaurant or in the marketplace, and the people would come and buy that meat. And, uh, the, the, but the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the mature believer would buy that meat and say, there's nothing wrong with it. But the weak believer say, you can't do that. The mature believer said, sure I can. Uh, anything that's of the earth, the Bible says, is up from God. Sure I can. What does Paul do? Paul says, forgive each other, accept each other. In fact, he even says in that passage, who are you to judge another man's servant? He was referencing the other. He says, you who are weak and who can't eat meat offered to idol because of your conscience, don't eat it, but don't accuse and judge the one who can, and vice versa. It's about forgiving and accepting. Now, the last here in this particular verse has, has to do with having a humble mindset. Now, the King James, you may have the King James, and you, if you read the King James, it has the word courteous. Unfortunately, the King James, as I've said, you've heard me talk about the, trans, the manuscripts, the groups of manuscripts, the codexes, and the King James is actually made from one of the newer, the more recent codex. What does that mean? When it comes to a scripture and reliability of manuscripts, 
we want to go all the way back to the oldest manuscript, not the newer manuscript. I'm not saying the King James is not reliable, but however, in this particular passage, the translation of Curtius is, is not uh, uh, supported well from all the other manuscripts. So what's trans, what you see in this word, passage is the word humility. Edmund Hybert again said the adjective humble is not used elsewhere in the New Testament, but it is appropriate in the concluding exhortation in a series that has called for submission to authority over them. It is the opposite of haughty, high-minded, and it does not brag about, about or push self. It rejoices over the successes of others. John MacArthur coming right behind that says, humility is arguably the most essential, all-encompassing virtue of the Christian life. Now, what is a humble mindset? Well, Paul gave the definition in Philippians when he said, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. I want you to turn quickly to James chapter 3. James, just turn, all you have to do is turn left, go back just a few pages, and you'll be at James chapter 3. James chapter 3, beginning in verse 13, he says, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds, and the gentleness of wisdom. Gentleness of wisdom. James used that word gentleness several times. But if you have, watch this, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. He says, this wisdom is not the wisdom which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. And then in verse 16, he says, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there's disorder in every evil thing. What is jealousy? What is selfish ambition? Selfish ambition is wanting my way, me first. Uh, third John, John in Third John speaks of Diotrephes and says, Diotrephes, who wants to be first among us, opposes me. That's a selfish ambition. And I dare say, as I, over the years, and I served on the district board of the Evangelical Free Church in Southern California, so I was privy to a lot of information about different churches. And I'd say over the years, as we got reports back, it all, many times the conflict rose out of somebody who wouldn't listen to the other people. Now, the second thing, in order to be a catalyst, and I have to, we've got to cover these kind of quickly, is by having a right response. First, having a right attitude, right thinking. Secondly, by having a right response. Look in the latter part. Back in James, I mean, First Peter, he says, not returning evil, evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. They were living in a hostile environment. You remember that? That's why the, you know, they were being persecuted. And it would be easy for them to respond back to those unbelievers. But don't miss this. Peter, in chapter 2, speaks to the believers there. And he says, hey, you need to love one another. And here he is again addressing the very same thing, which would lead us to believe that there was a problem in the church as well. Sometimes when you're persecuted, you're under stress. On the outside, sometimes you, have, you fight on the inside. And they had come to that. And so the first thing we do as far as having the right response is to have it without vengeance, he says. You don't strike back. I um, I think we all can can say that it can be hard to forgive. It can be hard to to something somebody says, something somebody does. Sometimes can be hard to forgive, right? But that's when we have to make a beeline to the foot of the cross and see Jesus on the cross 
hanging in my place, your place. And seeing that he's forgiven me of all the junk of my life, in the past and even in the future. He forgave me. How can I not forgive him? Those who offend me, I should say. The second thing, we're moving quickly here. We are to do it, the right response is we are to do it without vengeance. Secondly, without slander or gossip. Let's read on here. Verse 9. But giving a blessing instead. There's so much in this passage I don't have time to go into. But he says instead of insult, give a blessing. That word blessing is a word for which we get the word eulogy. It means to speak well. For you were called for this very purpose, that you might inherit a blessing. Verse 10, for the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from, oh, ouch, must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. Now he's quoting out an Old Testament passage. I think it's Psalm 34. He's actually quoting, I believe, out of the Septuagint translation. He says, For the eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous. Who are the righteous? Those who do not take up vengeance. Those who speak well and who do not carry a grudge and bitterness. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. What does that mean? That's just a poetic way of saying you cannot have fellowship with God if you're carrying around this baggage. If you're part of this. And you speak when it speaks of the tongue. It speaks all to all of us, doesn't it? Listen, it, 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 it's it, it's not just about the tongue. It's about the heart. You've heard me say it many times. It's it's all about the heart. God is not impressed with how good of a teacher, or how good of a preacher, or how good of a how well I serve in church, or how well I sing, and certainly not how much I know of the Bible. He's impressed with my heart, or maybe not. Back in James again, I meant to tell you to stay there, but James chapter 4, chapter 3 talks about selfish ambition. Chapter 4, he continues the thought. And remember again, the chapter break is not inspired. James is continuing the thought. And watch what he says. He's been talking about jealousy and selfish ambition. In verse 1, he says of chapter 4, What is the source of quarrels and conflict among, uh, conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust. Now, what is he talking about? He's, he's not talking about sensual lust. He's talking about you lust for your ambition. To have your way. You lust and you do not have, and so you commit murder. You're envious and you do, it cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel. See, verse 2 is tied all the way back to the previous verses. Hmm. Many believers, I'm convinced, live a fruitless life because of the things I speak of. It's so important. I've seen it over the years and it just grieves me. Let me ask you this. Do you think that God, do you think that God hates gossip and slander as much as he hates murder? What do you think? Lest you doubt me, Proverbs 6, 16. There are six things God, six things which the Lord hates. Yea, seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, pride, a lying tongue. And hands that shed innocent blood. There's murder. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that run rapidly to evil. A false, here it is, a false witness who utters lies. And watch this, a one who spreads strife among the brethren. 
Why is God so hard on the believers in telling them you need to love one another? Because it is the gospel. It is the gospel in close. When people love each other, the world takes note. When, when churches fight, argue, and bicker, they forget the gospel. They forget the lost world. They forget what they're supposed to be doing. And the world says, that church can never get along. They've had splits for over and over for years. I appreciate the freedom here to share and teach. Let me just say, let's put up the diagram real quickly. Paul makes it very clear in chapter 4 of Ephesians. We have, when you come to Christ, you have a relationship that's established. You are in Christ. It says that the righteousness of Christ is credited to your spiritual account. That's our position. That won't change. It's, every time it speaks of that, it speaks in the heirs' tense in the Greek, once and for all. But it, we also have a fellowship. And while our relationship may not change, our fellowship can change. And how can it change? With sin. And folks, we have a sin problem because we have a sin nature. And that sin nature often will use our tongue to hurt people. And God is saying to you today, whether it's here or somewhere else, maybe, or maybe we're believers at your work, maybe somebody that you've hurt, you've said something to you shouldn't, say, shouldn't have said, maybe you need to go to them and say, hey, I blew it. I didn't handle this right. You don't have to agree with them. You just say, I didn't handle it right. I tell our leadership all the time, it's far more important how we conduct our business than what the finished product is. So may God encourage you to be that catalyst for love in this church, either here and out in the world, or the believers that are in your world that are struggling, need somebody to put their arms around them and say, hey, I know what you're going through, and I'm with you, man. I'm walking with you all the way. As the Pentecostal people say, somebody needs to shout. 